Hello, uh, Billy Ray Hussey with Southern Folk Pottery Collector Society. I uh, want to welcome you uh, to our auction sale number 59 and our catalog is titled Come and See with Norman Smith, Alabama Potter, inviting you into a shop holding one of his pig cookers there. And we want you to come and see our, our selection. It's quite a selection, quite a variety. Uh, anyway, um, just kind of starting off here, looking at some of the pieces, and we do have a fully illustrated catalog available. Uh, this is an Anna, Illinois, Anna Pottery uh, Railroad Pig Flask, uh, real uh, trademark piece for them. Uh, Lanier Matters and his brother Edwin Matters, uh, some pieces of his mother, Ari Matters, down here, uh, especially a dance cordial, which is really unique. A little uh, Ohio uh, sewer tile. Frog, dated 1939. Uh, right here, these are pretty unique, uh, especially this one. This is a Browns from the 1920s, Browns Pottery up in Arden, NC, North Carolina. And this is really unique because it was in the collection of Daisy Way Bridges. And it's very, very unique because it's got an oriental uh, influence eyes, which I've never seen one before, never seen one. And I remember Daisy commenting on this years and years ago that she never saw one like this. Uh, this is from uh, Georgia. Uh, it's, a, it's an unusual piece, probably the uh, Ferguson's um, in Georgia, in Gillsville area. Real unique piece from an uh, extraordinary collection from the 1980s and 90s. Uh, this is a Harvey Reinhardt, H.F. Reinhardt and Valency signed face jug. And these pieces are probably the most highly prized of the 20th century face pieces. They all look basically the same with his with his mustache and his inserted pupils and question mark style ear shapes. But these are very, very highly prized by face joke collectors uh, because there's a low number known. Uh, some Berlin Craig pieces here. Uh, going over to here, here's a, a Berlin Craig up here a piece with the glass melt highlights. Some more Berlin Craig. Charlie Lisk over here. Uh, Charlie, of course, the protege of Berlin. Uh, a good picture of Charlie about there. One of Charlie's roosters. Uh, then we have uh, some uh, uh, 19th century Piedmont area salt glaze with uh, fly ash runs. And what that is, is the fly ash as it's going through the wood fired keel for the firebox to the draft hole at the back goes over and as it builds up and the heat uh, heightens in the keel. Uh, the, the fly ash begins to melt, which is what alkaline glaze is, ash glaze. So here is, is examples of, of just pure fly ash melting. This is, this is highly prized by collectors. And by the way, uh, somebody mentioned the other day that they've, they've been collecting this for like 30 years. And becoming a norm lately is that some of these seasoned collectors who have been focused in one area, whether it be salt glaze, alkaline, or whatever, uh, are trying to transition to some new realms. And for example, where they've been collecting salt glaze, they want to go into maybe art pottery. And what they're doing is thinking about, instead of cold turkey, trying to forsake their, their, their original passion, they want to transition. So I suggested to take early salt glaze art pottery, like from the C.R. Almond shop, Charlie Mastin Glaze, J.B. Cole, Jugtown, North State. And these areas will, uh, uh, still retain the, the tradition of salt glaze be it, send them into a new realm, which is most interesting. So there is a lot of change in, uh, from seasoned collectors. Now the new ones are, new collectors are trying to get into this and doing some remarkable finds. So anyway, some more 19th century rare markings. Uh, J.H. Owens, who was a transition part of these are sort of small pieces, but very important because of him being the transition from utilitarian pottery into the art pottery, and he died in 1923 before he ever got really started. So these are unique and important pieces. And this is lead glaze where he tried, and he did make uh, some lead glaze pieces. Uh, then we've got some um, 18th century uh, Piedmont area red wire makers, saw malloy plate, uh, a Weeks from New Salem. Uh, I mean, um, yeah, Weeks from New Salem. And then an early piece of uh, uh, Guilford County, Randolph County, earthenware. This is a German plate. It was in a collection, and of course it's good to compare. A piece out of uh, Washington County, Wythe County, Virginia, or possibly East Tennessee, Great Roads area. Um, 
the style is is indigenous of, of that area of decoration. It has some uh, the transition salt glaze from JB Cole where they were cobalting and they used cobalt as a pure hole decoration like that, which is really unique and rare because that was a short lived endeavor before they got into the colored leg glazes, which we have a good display here of some colored leg glazes that was uh, uh, typical of the 1920s and 30s. This is a Charles Maston agate glaze and he used to lock himself in a cabin at the CR Amish shop in Seagrove and he actually shut the blinds. And nobody ever, ever knew the recipe. And this particular piece has some codes on the bottom, which we've never been able to figure out. But he was a master with this glaze. And, of course, some Jugtown Chinese blue for the early 1930s. And that's just iconic of their um, oriental uh, shapes. Uh, some various ones from J.B. Cole. Chrome red, which was real popular in the 1930s and 40s. Uh, then uh, uh, the Hilton's Dogwood out of Hickory, North Carolina. And Pisgah Forest, uh, Walter Stevens crystalline uh, on his camel color glaze, which is really, really uh, unique pieces, uh, especially the coffee pot. Uh, here we got Ben Owen the uh, third, who made a traditional area shape, which a candlestick. There's very few makers that made those. J. H. Owens, Ben Owen, and uh, Farrell Craven, and Little Ben or Ben the third. Here's a cracker jar by Ben, and here's a 19. 40s or 50s photo from uh, High Point College of an exhibit. I've, look, he's peeping in a cracker jar. See, so he's raising the lid there to look. And another pair of Ben 1's candlesticks from the 1930s. This is the uh, Salt Glaze Urn, uh, kind of like a Persian type um, um, a translation. And this was a piece that actually housed or kept Jock Busby's ashes at one time for a short period of time. This is log cabin, transitional pottery, North State pottery here, Jugtown uh, lily vases. And then we'll move over here to some of the other pieces from different states. Uh, I've got some interesting Alabama pieces this time. Uh, here's a Cyrus Cogburn March CC piece that's uh, scarce mark with a little uh, uh, intricate decoration around, which is unique. Uh, Alabama chicken water with a with a, a little poem that somebody wrote and said if I could lay eggs so I guess it was uh, keeping the, the chickens healthy in somebody's name and somebody was unreadable but basically said I, if I if I could lay eggs so there's something there about a joke a little funky tale early piece of Connecticut uh, Crawford County pieces here uh, Lanier matters some of the other matters family members there uh, and a ring jug but these always are intriguing and you put them on your arm like this, and as you hunt and walk in the woods, you know, you, you can carry a canteen instead of keep your hands free to use your gun. Those are always unique pieces. Um, uh, a mahogany glaze from Alabama. Of, um, can't think of the potter's name right now. <laughs> That's okay. Can't remember everything. All right. Anyway, uh, some different things. Clint Alderman here. Uh, New York piece. Indiana. Salt glaze decorated there. Um, and some... Uh, going back into Catawba Valley here, Bucko County Browns with a real unique blue, cobalt blue. This is a gorgeous glaze. I've never seen that glaze. This is the only of uh, the second piece that we've ever saw or offered from the Browns of the 1920s. Uh, then we go into Catawba Valley and got some early pieces, which we'll go over there in just a moment. These are some other. This is John Goodman, who was apprentice of Daniel Siegel, some more Hilton. Dogwood, their blue edge, they was famed for this. Uh, shoulder jugs, which is a real popular uh, pre-prohibition uh, shape. Uh, Reinhardt's swirl, uh, again, that's Harvey and his brother Egg, and these are just phenomenal. They're signed, this was his Reinhardt Brothers, we got that there, so we'll see the mark, because it is pretty tough to see, but it's impressed that Reinhardt Brothers fell and see. Rutile, which is a natural ingredient from Catawba Valley, see a little bit right here, that uh, 1940s piece. Some more Berlin Craig pieces here uh, by his face. There again, Berlin did swirl his way with his birdhouse. And down here with a snake birdhouse, he did the swirl, which he continued making. And another piece down here uh, that he did. Um, interesting to have a face cuspidor this time. And we'll go over here in the middle just a minute and take a look at some more Catawba Valley pieces. Um, we've got three very early, probably 1830s pieces. It's so unique that these pieces have a groove 
a set of like a, a set of lines at the bottom, which is very Germanic right there. And it's on that piece there as well as this piece here has those lines on the bottom. These are early pieces, very early. Uh, you can mostly tell that old world shape by taper and a bulbous midsection or shoulder. And over here we got another piece which is a monumental. Uh, and we've got some other Burley Craig here. Uh, we got a rare, only the second or third known, the sign Spiegel family. is very delicately written, but we can make it out enough. Up here some various uh, potters of the late late 1800s, early 1900s. EMAO, which is uh, uh, Michael Leonard. Uh, here's Jules Ritchie. Uh, DH, which is Daniel Hartzog. AMF, which is uh, Alfred Fulbright. And AR, which is uh, Ambrose Reinhardt, which was Harvey Reinhardt's father. Uh, then over here for just a moment, take just a moment to look at this piece over here. And we might just camp out, so camp, put your feet up, okay? This is a monumental piece. This is early Daniel Siegel. It's signed twice. And Daniel made real uh, bulbous shapes and was just a master of large pieces. But this piece has the early mark, which early, I mean, in the late 1830s. And mind that he was only born in 1807, so it was probably his late teens when he made this piece. And if you'll notice the bottom, and it does have the lines at the bottom like I showed you on the earlier piece. So this is early. This is very dramatic, probably influenced from his father, Adam Siegel, who we think is a potter, but there's no known pieces by him, signed that is. And if you'll notice, he put it in sections. And, the, and the, this young man who, who's you know, a master potter, probably the, the most highly desired potter and talented potter in the whole American South, maybe America for or maybe a little partial, but at any rate, you can see mate caps if you look at the 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 the, the protrusions of the of the of the sections that he did, he was doing good down here, but as it got higher and higher and the top was open, uh, the clay got away from him. Now, remember this was very early in his, in his pot career, but he still managed to control it very very well. Very well. But the, 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 the importance of this thing is the signatures, the early signatures, but notice the usage of glass melts. Uh, and this came originally Howard Smith had discovered this piece back in the late 70s, early 80s at a local home. And there's never been another piece like this. Never, never a piece like this. But Tony Shake, who was the owner of Tony Marie Shake at one time, Tony always said it looked like fingers, like somebody was trying to get a hold of climb out. And it, the, the glass will see balanced it on there and balanced on the handle and melted. And there's glass runs on the inside as well. That's a monumental, highly important piece. Uh, probably one of the more significant, if not right at the top 10 uh, pieces of American, of Southern stoneware uh, of 19th century. That was made probably around at the end of the 1830s, as I said. All right, let's move over here for just a moment. Go back by our wing here a second. And just come back over this way. And this is Daniel Siegel here. This is his 1840s, 1850s. Big. Here's another Daniel Siegel this early. This is very early. This, this is like his trademark. Bulbous, well-controlled, finely potted, and the masterful glaze. This is like a 18, late 1830s piece by the marking. Here's his son, James Franklin Siegel, right there. Uh, you see the strong influence from his father's work. Those are fine pieces. Then we got another maker who has an interesting story. Uh, this is uh, Nathaniel Dixon. He worked for a lot of shops. We've come to the conclusion because of his variety of clays and shapes that the man worked at different shops. Even though he had his own shop near Goldstone, uh, this is a monumental piece with the cobalt, which is really rare. There's only two or three others known, signed N.H. Dixon with a big three on it. And these, these dark black green drippings are actually from the kill arch of the, of the wood-fired kill wood fuel kill, I'm sorry, that actually with the heat over time, the, the bricks had got so saturated with salt that they actually turned to glaze themselves and was dripping during the firing. And so this is a sign of a well-seasoned, uh, countless firings, uh, kill that's terribly broke in, uh, seasoned in for firing, but yet sometimes the arch will start sagging and different things, and sometimes you even find pieces with pieces fragment of melted brick fall off and this is like a masterpiece. This is free decoration here. 
and Nathaniel tried to list in the Confederacy and uh, caught pneumonia because he walked several miles in a, in a rainstorm and caught pneumonia and died before he could enlist in the Confederacy. So he was short-lived. Anyway, uh, and another piece by him, and of course this was signed four times in like a diamond pattern or a full way, but it looks like a diamond. N.A. sticks it four times. And that's one fire at his own shop with his own fire with his own clay source. But this one we believe might have been fired at another pottery that had cobalt and uh, probably bartered out a few pots for his own sales. And then the owner of the shop could have got some for an exchange. So this is an interesting, interesting story on these. Like I said, the, as, as um, um, uh, Norman Smith said, come and see. You know, so come and see these things. It's intriguing to see the history of these potters. And here's these Washington County. This was by an Edgefield maker that worked in Edgefield, South Carolina at train. So this is about 1820, 1830. But it has a five here. I'll turn it so you might can see it. Um, it's interesting. He's got a five in press, called five yellow, but he's got a diamond shaped coggle. And then out from each point of the diamond, he's got a line that goes up here. So he decorated it up a little bit. That could be uh, could be a cogburn piece. It's hard to tell, but a classic shape. Here, uh, another master potter that transitioned from red wire to stone wire, salt glazes, Saul Malloy in Alamance County, side twice with cobalt on it. And Solomon's work varied in shapes and glazes and styles, as did N.H. Dixon, uh, who, of course, uh, died very at a very young age, unfortunately. But Saul Malloy is known for his uh, high prolific uh, uh, red wire plates and shapes with, with all kind of um, German inspired uh, decorations. Here's a Jugtown, Busby's Jugtown Chinese Blue Bowl that actually this is a one of a kind in one way because this was in the Busby collection and Juliana herself used to bring this to the table at dinner parties, and she had a lot of guests. They really entertained for 30, 40 years, several decades. And she would she would bring this to the table, and, and, and while they were all talking, she didn't want to miss the conversation or the conversation to lull out, so she would bring it to the table, and they would actually wash the dishes at the table in this pot. So it, 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 it was really kind of like a folk tale and really entertaining and very, very interesting. Uh, another piece over here is from Edgefield with a small P on it, storage jar. Uh, this is, uh, there's two, two of these P's. There's a larger P that's probably about twice, really about three times this size. And there's two potters, a Pickens and a Presley. And we, we have learned over just a short period of time that Presley is this small P and Pickens is a larger P that worked at Curse's Crossroad with Thomas Chandler in the 18, late 1840s. That's a very important piece right there. Uh, and here's some more chrome red from J.B. Cole Pottery and Smithfield Art Pottery over Smithfield, which was operated by J.B.'s brother, Al, uh, Alex Sim, I can't think of his name, sorry. Anyway, uh, this is Jugtown, Busby's Jugtown. This is a rare uh, stoneware set of dishes, which is really rare to have because of the the, the hazardous in the firing conditions of salt glaze of these flat plates and bowls, but they're very well done by Ben One, Ben on One, and they're cobalt decorated. It's just, that's a unique group right there. Um, uh, then right here, we go back to Edgefield again, South Carolina slave made at uh, Horse Creek. Uh, I think this Horse Creek has a horseshoe on it. And not all pieces with horseshoes are Dave Drake's, okay? This is an early potter, early slave potter. It has a horseshoe and then six uh, pucks weights, so to speak, that distinguish the six-gallon piece. Large, really good condition. We, we're grateful for the caretakers of years past that took care of this, but it's novel about this is you've got a double-dip decoration that has all these runs on it from the double-dip, and that was a strengthening factor to strengthen the rim and the handle, the upper area during usage. Uh, that's a very important piece of pottery right there. Here is a piece from Mogan County, North Carolina, probably about 1900 or so. This is from the Donkles, who were Pennsylvania transplant. There was brothers, David, and um, 
Well, I forgot the other brother's name. Sorry, I'm not doing so well with mines. I'm rattling all this off. Excuse me. Look it up. Buy a catalog, okay? But uh, this is uh, a key mark impressed. When they first came down here, they made a step that said D and D the best. And, of course, that was short-lived because I, I imagine it offended a lot of potters because of their arrogance. But they were really good potters. I don't know if they were the best. But uh, this piece here is a four-gallon with a key impressed, which, of course, mimic their, their origin of the Keystone State, which is Pennsylvania. But they were truly remarkable. This thing weighs nothing. I mean, when you pick it up, it just jumps up at you. That's why we got our glass so it doesn't float out here in the shop. Okay? Anyway. Over here's another piece of art pottery. This is a, a wonderful piece. This is uh, from CC Coal Shop, and the green glaze with all the spots of white is really remarkable. It gives quite a quite a view with all that melting and going on. It's really an eye-catching piece. It's very well potted. That was probably by Charlie Cole's son, Thurston Cole. Here we got a, a Vernon Owens, uh, probably 1980s. Mammoth, monstrous, week-long chicken pie plate. And this, the, the name derives from the chicken in the middle. This was a, a, a trademark of the joke of the Busby's from the 1920s and 30s. They always put the chicken in the middle, but this is from the 1980s. And huge, it's just a huge piece. I mean, I mean look, look at the size of that thing. That's something. Uh, we have a long rifle from uh, Davidson County and is signed well, can't read. They got the catalog handy. I might catch it back up in a moment, but it is signed right here. Uh, we always, if we have a long rifle, we always try to get a signed one. And this is a, a really good maker. And I'll just come back to you on that. I don't know his name right now. I'll have to look at the catalog. But anyway, signed alligator, car walking stick there. The alligator right here on the shaft. Piece of tramp art, uh, linen box, some early Catawba Indian bowl. Uh, but here's the, here's the box, raises up like this, and you know, tramp art, and it's got little appliques on each side, which is pretty neat. It's a really neat box, and it's, it's made from stuff, so that's a really <laughs> neat piece. Got a John on the Well bank that actually works. I don't know where the lever is. It works. They penny in the whale's mouth. Uh, uh, pretty unique here, handmade. Uh, Carnival box with with all kind of animals things in it. Pretty neat. It's a circus wagon. Pretty neat little thing. Uh, uh, add some more salt glaze. We got a, a Hyber Fox. Uh, Eat it, Craven. We got some fox pieces here. Uh, M.R. Moffat. Um, Pascal McCoy. These are all day. J.D. Craven with his little asterisk, which we think was his mark of his wires that he made. Uh, some Hancock pieces, Moffat, a large bowl. Bowls are pretty unique to find. Uh, it's unsigned. So those are just some salt glaze makers. Uh, and then we're back into art pottery where it was changing from lead glaze, I mean from salt glaze into lead glaze. These are Jugtown early pieces, these like were late 1920s when they were transitioning from stoneware salt glaze. Here's a piece that was really unique, a local I mean Piedmont, so glaze, but it's got glass laid on the handle to strengthen the handle because you see it's twisted. He may have wanted to strengthen it, but you see it decorated like the Daniel Siegel. Some preserved jars, dinner plates, leg glaze dinner plates, um, some um, oil bottles from Jugtown, Busby's Jugtown. This is early, a large picture by Ben Owen, which is a inspired by J.H. Owens with the scroll into the cobalt. It has cobalt inside the rim. Which is decoration. Some Vernon Owens up here early, uh, 1980s there, I believe. That's Charles Moore Chicken. And we're back to good old Daniel here, just a masterpiece. I like to get her get close to Daniel. Oh, this is something. Um, and and behind of there, there's a, uh, a J.B. Cole a uh, large floor vase, which is just wonderful. A little twist of the house here, which gave a little personality to the piece. That's, that was a, this is like a precursor to their uh, renowned Malachite green, where it was purely just white over, but later on they really made some fantastic tones. 
and uh, deviations with the fire. Here's a Charlie Craven, he's C.B. Craven, he was the last of the Craven potters, active potters. This is from the 1980s. He was a fine potter, fine potter uh, for that. And then we'll finish up over here in just a moment. Um, we got, uh, here's, a, here's a clay crafter's flyer, or a copy of it. We got the actual flyer, but this is like from the 1930s from CR Almond Shop. Here's Ren Cole making pots. And here was a, uh, a list that you could order from them. There's their numbers on there and the price, how much they were. And this is from the, probably the 1930s. It says made by Almond Potters, Seagrove NC. What's that say? Route one, okay. Really important to know where to find these shops. Okay, Charles Moore. We got some uh, Ben Third. This is early. Peace influx from his grandfather. This is Ben Third. There's a picture of Jason Cole, uh, probably in the nineteen late nineteen twenties, probably uh, uh, at his wheel. A photograph, which is really rare. Uh, then we got just very ones. This is Billy Ray Hussey. I think I know him. That's some early piece of his. There is a uh, uh, face lamp of his, more Ben the Third, Ben Owen the Third. Uh, we got a few uh, uh, um, stencil jugs, North Carolina, which is pretty rare. Uh, Virginia, North Carolina, Tennessee, and Georgia, and South Carolina stencil jugs are rare and highly prized. Uh, a piece of JB Cole with some glaze they were trying, cobalt, Bill Rezzi again, some art pottery. Um, we got some and irons, uh, African American couple here. Here's the man over here, and there's the woman over there. And they're not marked, but uh, we feel like they're probably southern. Uh, could be something in Georgia, made Georgia. Could be made South Carolina. I don't really know for sure their origin. Uh, some some early 1900s uh, utilitarian shapes from the Johnsons. This was signed to Clayton Pottery in Georgia. Nope, South Carolina. I'm sorry. Yeah, Clayton Potter in, in South Carolina. G.F. Cole, uh, Emmett Albright, uh, who worked at the North State Pottery in the 1930s. Uh, a trademark for him in the 1980s was the wild turkey jug with a stopper right there. This is a piece of um, uh, Wilkes County. We don't know this maker, but very highly prized ovoid shape. This is uh, uh, Wilkes County as well, J.W. Carpenter, Wiles. And unusual shape is W.W. Baller, a unique piece. I don't know why that thing didn't get salted, but there was a little window, so something would block that, but that makes that piece really unique. Some art pottery here from the Carolina Pottery, which is a coup vase, really unusual. There's a pot there that's really got unusual glaze on it, uh, and really don't know exactly. Maybe Mecklenburg County or Union County, North Carolina, South Carolina, but anyway, that, that glaze is just phenomenal. It really got burnt hard. It's even warped at the top, but this glaze almost looks like an animal effect. Stork from uh, South Carolina, Columbia. This is uh, Upstate South Carolina, Spartanburg, Greenville area. This is Albert Fulbright in Upstate South Carolina. Uh, these are uh, Steve Farrell. Steve Farrell, uh, who is a potter that uh, has got some health concerns now. He's not potting anymore. Uh, he tried to revive the Edgefield tradition in the 19. Uh, late 80s, 90s. These are Welchel in South Carolina, uh, upstate, and you can always tell by their stencil decorated. These are very, very important pieces, uh, especially one with handles, which you don't see. Uh, and this is Billy Henson, who was another one. And we've got some Civil War pieces. Uh, this is a, a survivor's group from the Anderson prison camp in Anderson, Georgia, where many northern uh, captives, or Yankees, if you will, uh, were, were, were uh, kept at a POW camp, and it has a pretty notorious uh, back but history, but here's a letter, and here's the interpretation of the letter. This writer, uh, and his name was Hiram Buckingham, he was from Connecticut, and here's the pen, and the survivor's pen is really, really extraordinary to have one, uh, uh, to be a survivor of Andersonville. They made the pens to give to him. And there's a sketch, and that's a remarkable, truly remarkable sketch of the, the, the lean-to, one guy over Washington in a tub, kind of bathing, taking him a bird bath, if you will, uh, the food and their baskets and stuff that they had to eat there, and one guy shaving, and so it just shows a normal day, and this describes about him. 
at that particular camp and it's dated April 20th, 1864. So it was near, pretty near the end of the war, but still it didn't make a difference because they were POWs. Uh, we got some South Carolina bottles here. Uh, these are these are reproduction bottles here, but that's an original South Carolina dispensary bottle, about 1890, 1900. Some Texas ant traps, and the table leg was set here, and you would fill this up with either kerosene or water, and the ants couldn't get over to the leg and go up, and so there's a set of four, which is really rare. We've had one or two over the past in all 30 years. And we've never had a set. And these are from the, um, oh, I think it's the Prothro shop. Anyway, these are probably, you know, 1900 ish, but it's really unique to have a set of four. Uh, this is just a group here, but this is interesting here a mortar and pestle, uh, probably from the 1800s, I would imagine, and very unique. So you would grind uh, whatever you need to grind there. Could have been a druggist, could have been just for grinding some kind of. Um, uh, herbs or whatever, but it was used for that. This is early East Virginia stuff here. Another Civil War uh, tobacco card of the Confederate Greats, Generals, the Greats, and that's, uh, uh, I think his name is Hampton. Uh, he was a general, uh, looks like a, maybe a two-star general. Uh, here's some Tennessee pieces here. Uh, grease lamp, which is what they had. They would put grease in the bowl here and have a wick rolled out of like cloth and they would hang it in here and it would saturate and it would burn it. That was what they had of a night. That's why they went to bird with the went to bed with the chickens. That's all the light they had in the eighteen hundreds. Here's a sign not by maker but somebody's name his name is Lewis uh, a monkey jug and of course it's a kind of derivative of a, of a folk tale about, you know, being drunk as a monkey and the monkey would drink out of it sideways because it shows that, you know, straight up you'd be real uh, control of your actions, but with it off to the side, it, it's the dizziness of being intoxicated, so to speak. Uh, slave made, edge fill, um, one handle jugs for storage, uh, an edge fill slave made storage pot right there. Some Catawba Indian pieces, and these are really unique that these pieces have a label, and I've never seen that label before, and you know, it's in the catalog, but it tells about the history of the Catawba Indian, and these were made for tourist trade here, and that's really, I've never seen that, I've not handled a lot of this through the years, but sporadically, we've handled Catawba and Cherokee Indians, but that's really unique to have those labels, and they all, all the pieces have labels on them, the other Edgefield South Carolina storage jar with a lid, uh, Shenandoah Valley, Virginia, uh, Cuspidor Spittoon. And I think we've we've uh, come in pretty close to the end here. Another uh, Virginia, uh, and this was Mr. Hackett, who was a German uh, immigrant. But a very interesting story. We have our catalogs have biographies, so it's very good by him. And a mallet bottle that probably dates from the mid-1700s. And it's got a concave bottle you know, where they blew it. And that was the, the broke it off from the blowing. And they put the, the little uh, rim on it by hand, like a ring and set on top. And a little folk art bird cardinal, which was pretty unique. So uh, I think there's something for everybody. And I wish you would come and see, as Barbara Smith invited you. Uh, I appreciate your time, and I hope you were captivated. Thanks again. Bye now.